church, we love God. Make no mistake about that. At our church, we believe Jesus is God. We're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. We believe that prayer moves the hand of God, and it's normal for every believer to be intimate with God and devoted to His cause. At our church, we believe the Bible is God's Word. It's real, it's living, and it's active. We believe freedom is the heart of God for every believer, and we value humor, simplicity, teamwork, and a positive outlook on life. At our church, we're about developing great relationships with God, each other, and those in our community. At our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that he really died on the cross, and that he really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and will not water down or candy coat that message, ever. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we're not concerned about where you've been, but where you're going. We believe that all people matter to God, and therefore matter to us. Today, you have chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially life-changing message. Welcome to our church. Esther is a great book to be in. Ruth's a great book to be in. There's great Bible truths from this book. So as we go through it, I'll give you just a few extra insights. And uh, I'm sure you're going to be pleased with the book of Esther. But anyway... Any prayer requests that are pressing that we need to... Um, Donald Trump, let's all pray for him. Yes. I mean, lift him up in prayer. Um, <clears throat> Bruce was telling a little bit this morning, but this impeachment thing they got going on, they always mm -hmm. want to attack right before the election. And I know a lot of the churches are lifting him up in prayer, and I think we should too. Uh -huh. I mean, yep. I, I don't agree with a lot of things that comes out of the man's mouth, but I do know God put him in office. That's right. So um, he's there for a reason, uh -huh. and we need to uh, pray for him. Yeah. Also, this is the piece of trumpets that we're in. Does anybody like to volunteer to blow the shofar? <laughs> <laughs> Before we go into worship, <laughs> I'm stuck with it, so I'm going to try. <laughs> no, I don't know. It's been a long time since I blew this, but before we go into worship, I'm going to blow it. I have a hard time blowing my nose, so I don't think I'm going to blow it. I'll get it. I think he just dropped a mouthpiece on it. I wouldn't know what drugs were if they were laid in front of me. Yeah. It's sad. 
I mean, <laughs> I, I just don't. I've never had to deal with it. I've never been through anything like this. It can be on something as little as just a little piece of paper. If you're a mental prison, now another that But he ain't really trying. He really is. Yeah. Let's remember our prayer box, too, to look at. Everything in here I can put up. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, I gotta be my nephew's daughter, and her name's Melissa. She's probably 30, but I read one of her posts on Facebook. I really don't know it. When, when she requested me as a friend, I had to ask who is she. She's got my same last name, so I figured she's part of the family, but yeah. I never met her in person. I never met her in person. They look, she lives in Oregon, I think. But, uh, from what I gather on her Facebook um, posts and stuff, she's been on math. She's been through oh. some sort of rehab, but she says she just doesn't feel right. She doesn't feel right. Like, yeah, yeah, she lost a daughter, and mm -hmm. daughter died, and she said she just doesn't know that she wants to go more. And uh, she said she just doesn't... Uh, she says she loves herself, but you know, and she tries to love others and everything. But you know, obviously, she doesn't have a love of God, you know. And uh, so pray for her. Okay. Let's look these prayer books up. Loving Heavenly Father, we just come before you, Lord. We just praise your Father for who you are. God, you're the only one we can come to with our needs. And Lord, we lift these young ones up to you, Father. Lord, the devil's after our children. He's after our young ones. And he's after our old ones, too, Father. And he uses drugs, prescription drugs. He uses anything he can get to get to them. Lord, we just ask that you would intervene for these young ones. Melissa and uh, um, his nephew, Father, we just ask that you would just touch, heal, restore, bring them to you, God. Holy Spirit, just go in, soften their heart, and bring them to you because you're the answer. You're the answer that they fall in love with you greater than the drug that they, they want to run to to heal the pain. And that's what it is. It's a way to deal with the inside emotional pain that they feel. Lord, we just ask that you'd move in a mighty way. We just ask that you would get a hold of them, God. They belong to our family. And we belong to you, Lord. And we stand on your promises, God. We stand on your promises because we trust and we believe you. Hallelujah. Praise your name. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Let's get our breath sometimes. It could be aches and pains. It could be not feeling good. It could be just struggles in life, our job, our, our, our married life, whatever trouble that we're in, and we can sometimes get feeling like. God, oh, don't you love me? Seems like we love everybody else, but I'm just not seeing the promises. I'm just not feeling it. I don't love me. And the Lord said, just as sure as He's God above, He loves you. And don't you think for one minute, just because things aren't happening the way you think they should be happening, that they're not the way God wants it to be. And you know, just like this book Esther we're going through, we can see where God worked her steps into that position. Well, she had to go through difficulties before uh, she went into being the queen. Mm -hmm. She had to be ripped away from her family. You know, did you ever think about all the women that were ripped away from their families? A lot of them didn't want to go. Most of them didn't want to go. Mm -hmm. Pulled away. No one. And their families back home. What if you lost your daughter? Some, the king just come and 
ripped your daughter away and you knew that she was going to be put in this harem and he was just going to have his way with her when he wanted to. And if he didn't like her, he was just going to put her out. Never to have a wife. Never to be married. Never to have a children. In other words, her hopes and her dreams for a future was gone. All those women pulled away. I don't know where I was going. <laughs> anyway. We heard it. <laughs> anyway, God loves you. Yeah. He foreordained her steps. You know, he knew what was going to happen. And sometimes in life you got to take a stand for God. It was her time to take a stand for God. It was her time. She could have not said anything. She could have not have stood up and said she was a Jew. She could have kept quiet, but she didn't. What'd she say? If I perish, I perish. In other words, she's going to take a stand for the Lord. And there's sometimes in our life where we, we have to stand up and say something. Yeah. Say who we are. Say what we believe. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, don't talk that way around me. Don't use my God's name in vain because that's my God you're talking about. Uh -huh. We have a right to say that. Sometimes we have to take a stand like Esther did. I think about uh, who else in the book? Shad Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They took a stand, now didn't they? They didn't, they didn't say they were going to eat and bow down to the king. They took a stand. What happened to them? They got thrown in a fire. Yeah. There was tribulation, things they had to go through in their life, but God foreordained a purpose for them. They didn't burn out in that fire. Who stepped in? God. Yeah. But see, sometimes in our heart, we have to come to the conclusion, I'm going to stand. And if my God doesn't deliver me, I'm going to stand for him. Mm -hmm. If in, in our elements that we have as we grow older, you know, hey, I believe in healing. I believe God can heal you, and I believe that he, he can, and he will, and his promises is true and just. But see, what if he doesn't? You're still going to believe in him? You're still going to love him? You're still going to stand for him? You better. Sometimes in your heart, you have to make your mind up. I will serve you, God, no matter what. Amen? Amen? Amen. Yes. You know, I was thinking about the church and me and how I've been up and down about, should I, you know, should I check it all and forget it and just, because doesn't seem like I'm seeing the promises. Doesn't seem like I'm seeing what I feel like God put in my heart. And the women's home didn't go the way I thought it was going to go because that that is something God put in my heart. But see, here's the thing: I I had it, I took it, and I ran with it. See, and everything became what I wanted. And God's like, the little girl. <laughs> Hold up, little girl. It's like a kid that sees something, you know, and they take off running for it because their mom and dad's taking them maybe to the fair and they see cotton candy. And there they go. They're all running for that cotton candy. They won't, don't want to wait on the father to lead them there because what's going to happen? They have to pay for that cotton candy. And who's got the wallet? Daddy does. Uh -huh. Amen? Right. Yeah. Daddy does. Right on. So <coughs> God's going to fulfill the purpose of what he wants. Not what Roxy wanted or whatever. And I feel like he's doing that. And you know what? I feel like this church is blessed. We yeah. all have hearts that love one another. We all have hearts that really want to uh, study the Word, learn the Word, get into the Word. And we're blessed for that. Uh, Esther 2. I'm going to read the first uh, scripture in Esther 2. After these things, when the anger of King uh, Erxes had subsided, he remembered Basti and what she had done and what had been decreed after her. Now, uh, 
between chapter 1 and chapter 2, there's a period of four years that go by. And during this time is when Xerxes went to Greece and tried to conquer Greece. But he lost that battle uh, at 480, not, uh, four, let's see, 481, 479. Uh, B.C. Now when it says that he came back and he remembered Vasti, that means, you know like when a man goes out and they have a hard day's work and things just don't go right, say the tools break down, the truck has a flat tire, you couldn't get anybody to help you, you know, you're just, you, you've had a beat day and you come home. And what usually happens to a married man? The wife will comfort that man, right? She'll usually get him a cup of coffee, get him something good to eat, set him back in his lazy boy. I mean, <laughs> she comforts the man. That's a wife's job is to comfort a man when they're, they're feeling kind of down and lowly and nothing went right. And, and that's kind of a woman's job. So he returns home from this war with Greece, trying to overtake Greece, and he couldn't conquer it. So he's kind of bitter. You know, he's kind of angry. He's down. And where's his woman? Oh, yeah. I remember I put her out. I dethroned her. I, I don't have a woman anymore. I don't have a queen anymore. So he's kind of grumbling around about not having a queen, not having a woman at the home. And his counselors, his advisors, are whatever you want to, the, the men that talked him in to putting her out in the first place, start hearing him, whining. Oh, oh we got to do something about this. We can't let him put her back on the throne again. So we got, we got, oh, oh, we got to come up with a plan. So they tell him to go find these other women throughout the kingdom. Find them in. And he kind of likes that idea. Huh. I'll just have my pet of the litter. You know, well, uh, uh, to him, that was an inviting idea. Uh, verse 2 through 4. Then the king's attendants who served him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Let the king appoint overseers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather every beautiful young virgin to the city of Susan, to the harem, and to the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let their cosmetics be given them. Then let the young lady who pleases the king be queen in the place of Vasti. And the matter pleased the king, and he did accordingly. So not only did he send men out to gather up these women, do you realize what happened here? He got men and castrated them. A bunch of men and castrated them. So the, the virgins that he gathered up, they couldn't have their way with them. He was a very distrusting king. And then he put in charge, hey guy, was the his his main count, uh, custodian uh, eunuch? So he was the head of the other units. So he made sure that they did what they were told. Now, like I said before, these young women were worked away from their homes, and they didn't want to go. And you know, I was thinking about like when they threw these women in the harem after, even after he, he picked Esther, the other women, um, they would never see the king again, never have children, never have, have they live out their days in that harem with all these eunuchs in charge to take care of them. Now, I was thinking about a bunch of women when they all get together. Most cats. Yeah. In house, yeah. Women cannot, for very long, live with each other. What happens? They get catty. They start fights. Now, jealousy. Yeah, jealousy. Whatever it might be. 
a lot of the units had to be there to uh, keep them from killing each other because they fought. They fought. It was a terrible thing for all these families to have their kids ripped away from them like that. It really meant that not only did their child lose their hopes and dreams, but their family did too. For what? Can you imagine as a father, a mother, hopes and dreams you have for your kid, growing up having kids of their own, never to have that, never to have a grandchild? You know, that would be hard. Uh, five through seven. Now there was a, there was at the city in Susan a a Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the captives who had been exiled with uh, Jeconi, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had no father or mother. Now the young lady was beautiful of form and face. Now King James might say, um, I can't remember what it says, but it, it says she was not only, more or less the same, she's not only beautiful on the outside, she's beautiful on the inside. See, we all know there can be beautiful women, models. Oh, yeah. They've got the look going on and the makeup and the lashes and the hair and, and adorned so beautiful, but be the most nastiest person on the inside. And then there's beautiful women on the inside and not so beautiful on the outside. Well, see, this is saying... That Esther was not only beautiful on the out, she was beautiful on the in. And that reminds me of, uh, I think it's Proverbs 31. Well, let's just look over there, I'm not real sure. Proverbs 31 30, I think. So it's like saying, when you're beautiful on the inside, you're beautiful for a reason, because you know who created you. I think that she was a humble woman. I think that she was probably soft-spoken, gentle, um, loving. Yeah, loving. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Now, we don't know. Uh, scripture doesn't say what happened to her mom and dad. It could be that in the exile, with everything happening, that they were killed. I, it doesn't really say. But we know that she was an orphan. And Mordecai kind of adopted her as his own daughter and raised her up. And... Uh, <coughs> he loved her as his own. She loved him. I imagine that she felt indebted to him mm -hmm. because she had no parents. Mm -hmm. And since it was just Mordecai, you know, she wanted to obey him and do everything that he told her to do. She knew that he had, he was a noble man by taking her in. So let's uh, read for verses 8. Read verse 8. So it came about when the command and the de degree of, of the king were heard, and many young ladies were gathered to the city of Susan and to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was taken to the king's palace and to the custody of Haggai 
who was in charge of the women. You think this king, um, <clears throat> I was thinking how he castrated all these men. You would think if you had a friend, uh, like he, uh, Haggai was his custodian, his main guy, you would think it, you'd at least trust him. But this is a way of insurance. <laughs> no one's touching his woman. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. You gotta realize too, those eunuchs didn't want to be eunuchs. Yeah. They yeah. were jerked away from their home, brought in there, and were yeah, right. being, being eunuchs. So they have no future either. They have no kids. That's right. Their parents have no grandkids. They never. They can never. And, and most women ain't gonna marry one. So yeah. they have no life either. Yeah. Except right there in the kingdom. Right there in the kingdom. Yeah. So they figure, well, I can't do anything now, so I might as well do what I was called to do here. Where does it say, they, where does it say they captured the men? And, and I just, let's see, just read I didn't it. miss it. Let the king appoint overseers and all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather every beautiful young virgin to the city of Susan. Susan. Where are you at? To the hero. Uh, verse 3. But it doesn't say anything about capturing the men. Well, he appointed them. He had to go. If you appoint somebody, you go charge them. As king, they had to come. So maybe it was. What that? Yeah, they could have been already in this. I just wondered if I couldn't find where it said that. So. But what it meant was that they could have already been eunuchs, but what it meant is he appointed them that they were there to serve a purpose. Hey, guy would have made sure that they were all eunuchs. I'm well, sure. He does mention uh, major eunuchs in the Bible. Yeah, yeah, I know that. That's for sure. But when they made them eunuchs back then, uh, they don't make them like they now. They, you know, a man can be fixed and not have children. Back then, they couldn't do anything when they got there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, only one way. Um, yeah, can you imagine? And, and, you know, he was a smart king in a way because, you know, <coughs> I don't know the age of a lot of the eunuchs. They could have been older ones, younger ones, but he knew, like, if you're in, the, if you're of a certain age, you know, your flesh gets the better of you sometimes, and that was his way of insurance of taking care of it. You know, I'm not going to wonder if and or but it's going to be okay. I have to trust them. That was his way of trusting them. Um, Some of the women might have be bizarre for the eunuchs that they were the eunuchs. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly right. It goes both ways. Yeah. You know, when you're young, uh, women are just as, you know, as men are, so. <laughs> They're human beings. That's what we God made it, so <laughs> there's nothing wrong with it, if, if it's in the right way. But anyway, uh, verse 9 through 11, it says, Now the young lady pleased him and found favor with him, so he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and food and gave her seven choice maids from the king's palace and transferred her and her maids to the best place in the harem. Esther did not make known her people or her kindred, for Mordecai had instructed her that she should not make them known. Every day Mordecai walked back and forth in front of the court of the harem to, to learn how Esther was and how she uh, fared. So something about Esther pleased Haggai. Now, don't you think there was some period of time here that we had went by because there's just not something right away that's going to please Haggai. I mean, he's going to watch her. He's going to study her. 
He's going to see how her character is. He's going to see how she deals with other women. So I, I believe a period of time went by here. And then he found favor with Haggai. And he's like, huh, you know, she's really standing out above all the rest of these women. So then he moves her on up, as uh, he would say, I'll move it all in. <laughs> well, anyway, he moves her up to like a penthouse. <laughs> Paraphrasing here. But he kind of moves her up, gives her seven maids to help take care of her, loads her up with extra cosmetics, extra perfumes. Uh, and... Uh, Maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe there was something about her, like, maybe she, it's just the way she talked. Maybe she talked gentle. Maybe it's the way she dealt with the other women. Maybe it's her love of flowers. Maybe it was her love of animals. Maybe it was uh, just how she walked. Something about her stood out. Now, during this time, let, we got, we got to remember, during this time, Mordecai is going nuts worrying about her, fretting back and forth, you know, going to the gate, the courts and the gate to find out how she's doing. He's worried. Don't you think Mordecai's praying? I think Mordecai's praying. So I think Mordecai's prayers gave her favor. Yes? Something I never thought about until I watched the movie, but, you know, if she was to be clean, that meant that you know, at some point, if something happened to the king, she might be in charge of the country mm -hmm. or the kingdom. And, you know, she probably had to be extremely smart to mm -hmm. pick up things, you know, like they showed her studying the books and reading and all that kind of stuff, too. So, you know, that was probably something else they looked at. So yeah. How did she, you know, learn and do and, you know, what was her, mm -hmm. uh, you know, makeup as far as intellectually, too? I mean, yeah. yeah. I'm sure during that time there was conflict in between the women too, and he watched how she dealt with that. And maybe she had a lot of wisdom with how she dealt with other people, and that's something that the queen would have had to have, like you said, taken taken over the kingdom. Maybe it was her work ethic. You know, maybe she put in a hard day's work and didn't try to cheat or anything. Now, she, during this time, she could have told other women of the Jewish heritage. You know how women get together so they sometimes talk. Some guys. But she could have told of her heritage. I got a secret. <laughs> I got a secret, though. And, but we all know secrets don't stay secret. Right? <laughs> and uh, we... we we try to, but usually our mates, it, usually our mates are the ones that hear it because they're our mates. But um, she kept it to herself. She kept, didn't tell anybody about her Jewish heritage. Or she obeyed Mordecai. 12 through um, 14. Now when the turn of each young lady came to go into King uh, Erxes after the end of her 12 months under the regulations for the women for the days of their beautification were completed as follows. Six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and the cosmetics for women. The young lady would go into the king in this way. Anything that she desired was given her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go in, and in the morning, she would return to the second harem, to the custody of uh, Jazgas, the, king, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go out again unless uh, the king delighted in her, and she was summoned by name. And uh, my guess is to make sure that he had already taken one out and used her placed her over here, and that way he could work his way on down and not get her mixed up again. <laughs> hey, but anyway, uh, back then, it wasn't uncommon. <laughs> I said number, number one, number two. Yeah, yeah, 
but never. <laughs> uh, back then, it wasn't uncommon for the climate. The climate was really hot there, wasn't it? And their skin was dark for a reason. So dark-skinned people, they kind of sweat a lot. And uh, they used a lot of perfumes and oils and stuff, like we use deodorant today. That was their way of covering and cleansing. They didn't bathe the way we bathe today. So that was their way of covering odor. And I mean, what man wants a stinky woman? So that was their way of making sure she was fresh and beautified and ready to go in to meet her king. Now, and a lot of the oils today, you can even find a lot of the oils today, and they're pretty strong when you smell them. Uh, so you can just imagine the raw uh, kind back then. That was really strong. They used that for burial purposes, so you know it had to be strong. Um, why 12 months? Mm -hmm. Anybody got any thoughts on that? Well, it's believed that it was 12 months because when they took these women in, they were thought to be virgins, but they didn't really know for sure. But if they waited the period of time and nobody gave birth, then, you know, they knew they were virgins. And, um, you know, also, I think they wanted the, they wanted, um, the main eunuch, the one that was close to the king, to get to know these women, to get to know them. And don't you imagine the king was going down and going, what do you think? Who's your favorite king? You know, what's your thoughts on her? What's your thoughts on her over there? What do you think? Don't you think he was kind of doing that? I mean, how do you get to know somebody? He asks questions. Right? You ask him questions. Well, he could he wasn't going down and talking to these women, so his closest person he could talk to was his main counselor, the you know, Hagar. So I can I can see him asking him, what do you think? Who's your pick? You know. Well, what do you pick her for? What stands out about her? And uh, so I I my guess would be that the twelve months was because of finding out if they're not pregnant. Yeah. Another thought that crossed my mind is I'm sure they didn't have any diseases. Mm -hmm. True. Mm -hmm. They got ill or anything like that. Because, you know, if he was sleeping with that many women, I mean, you know, it's hard to tell what maybe some of them had. So that he wouldn't be, you know, like STDs <coughs> and things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. I don't know if that's just a thought. Mm -hmm. Possible, yeah. There's a lot of things. We well, should more have to have the STD than them, though, because he was the one that was moving around. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. 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 Mm -hmm. I guess, right. you know. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, they had to learn how to be beautiful and how to be etiquette of the queen mm -hmm. and all yeah. that stuff, too. Sure. Put the right makeup on and the right oil on. Mm -hmm. But I'm at... I think I got to know that each one of these women. So he kind of, that's why he picked out Esther and put her in a different place. He wanted to show her uh, partialism. You know, he wanted, to, he wanted to put her up a little bit higher. Now each one of these women, when they were called out to go in to meet the king, they were given, like the movie said, they were given their pick of whatever they wanted to adorn themselves with. You know, what woman doesn't want to be sparkly for her man? Or, or like a, I tell women when I do their nails, they always want the glitter, you know. I want a little bit of glitz. And then, so they wanted to dress up for their, their man and look. Now back then, headdresses were very, were very popular. And I imagine they had the gold chains around the neck. And I, now that gold was heavy. It's not like our gold today. That gold was heavy. So, I, can you see all these women? Uh, well, it's like going in a jewelry store, you know, and, and the guy who owns the jewelry store is, okay, everything's free, take whatever you want, and everybody's running and grabbing the diamonds and stuffing them in their pockets and putting necklaces around their neck, and I imagine these women were like that. They just took off and just was getting whatever they could get. 
And then when they went in to see the king, all the king could see was fancy headdress, fancy necklace, fancy jewelry up their arms, fancy rings, fancy bracelets around their feet, everything that moved would jingle, you know, and I imagine that's all they see. So, so they could take whatever they wanted. Uh, 15 through, oh, let's just go on. 15 to whenever I stop again. Now when the turn of Esther, the, the daughter of um, Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter came to go in to the king, she did not request anything except what Haggai, the king Unic, who was in charge of the women, advised. And Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to the king, Erxi, to his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebet, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than, it, than all the women, and she found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Esther. Now, um, I can imagine... You know, Esther is like going up to him, hey guy, and going, what do you think I should take? What do you think I should adorn myself with? And he, he says, well, how about that itty bitty, itty bitty tiny little bracelet or necklace? And she takes something small. I, I can imagine, oh, what you were I can imagine that it wasn't much. Because I can imagine that maybe Haggai would say to the king, you know what, uh, you know how you know the right one to pick, the one I said that I think stands out above all the rest? She'll come in, not so adorned, but with her own baby. She'll have a little, little thing. So when all the other women came in, they were, had all the, all the bling. But when Esther came in, Esther had her own beauty. In other words, she not only was beautiful on the inside, she was beautiful out. But she didn't need all the other glitz. Because see, when she came in, she wanted this, the king to see her. She didn't want the king to see false stuff. You know, all the jewelry, all, you know, uh, a lot of businessmen, they wear them big old pinky diamonds and what, what do you call them? The Rolex. Rolexes. And they have to have $5,000 suits. And, you know, they have to really look, look, look like they're somebody, you know. None of that stuff impresses me. You know what impresses me? Character, ethics, um, a soft heart, a loving heart. And that's what should impress the king. That's what impresses our people. Our what's on the outside or what's on the inside? It's what's on the inside. That's why I like that song that was played today. Yeah. You know, Lord, when words are not enough, Lord, to tell you how I love you, look on my heart, yeah. because my heart says I love you. You know, we fail every day, don't we? Don't we fall every day? Maybe we mess up, hit our thumb with a hammer and a cuss, or I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe we have bad thoughts that go through our head. But we fail every day, but don't you know our Father knows that? He knows that, and He still loves us. As long as we say, God, I'm sorry, He forgives us. We're His children. We're His babies. We're His babies. And He wants to take care of us. And a lot of times, we don't let Him. And we have our little hissy fits, you know. It's like a baby having a little tantrum. But he still loves us. He still picks us in his arms and goes, shh. I'm going to take care of it. Calm down. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. I'm telling you, it's going to be all right. God's going to take care of it. And um, the king places the uh, crown on her head, and she becomes the queen. 
Then the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his princes and his servants. He also made a holiday for the provinces and, the, and gave gifts according to the king's bounty. When the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Now, the king's gate or the court's gate uh, is where business was conducted. That's where all the businessmen got together, or the nobles, they call them, the people of importance, and they got together and they did business deals. They talked about things that were going on and what they wanted to do and, and stuff <coughs> like that. So if you wanted to know anything, the news of the town, that's where you went. So he, Mordecai places himself there to hear what's going on, and he overhears these men plotting against the king. He overhears that they want to kill him. And it's thought, uh, it's thought that they wanted to kill the king because they weren't pleased with what he did with Vesti. I don't know how you pronounce her. Vesti? Vesti? <laughs> it sounds like Vesti. <laughs> Vesti. But anyway, but, but anyway, it's thought that these men were not pleased with what King Erxes did with Vesti. So they and wanted a plot to kill him. So he was at the gate and he overheard this. Esther had not yet made known her kindred or her people, even as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther did what Mordecai told her as she had done when under his care. She still respected Mordecai. She still was not going to say a word. In those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, uh, Big then and Teresh, two of the king's officials, from those who guarded the door, became <clears throat> angry and sought to lay hands on King Erxes. But the plot became known to Mordecai, and he told Queen Esther. And Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. Now, when the plot was investigated and found to be so, they were both hanged on a gallows. And it was written in the book of Chronicles in the king's presence. Now, um, Mordecai, if we can look back at this, was placed at that gate for a time and purpose for his life. Because this is what's going to save his life in the future, as we, you know, all know that. Is he'll be in there and tell Queen Esther, and Queen Esther uh, taking care of the problem. Now, the gate, when it says hanging on the gala, gallows, they, the Persian um, emperor, the way they took care of things was, when they say that, uh, they impaled them on poles. Now, when it says impaled on poles, it's thought by some theologians that they were the ones who invented crucifixion. When it says impaled on poles, it can mean not only straight up and down, which was in the hip, uh, Jophethus, that talks about how they were impaled on these poles. But it can be, I don't know, either way. We don't know how they were hung on trees, but they were hung on trees. It could be straight up and down. It could be like our Lord and Savior crucified or whatever. But that's how they hung them. So gallows can be uh, different than what, like I believe when Judas, when he did what he did, I believe he hung, actually hung himself with a rope. There's a difference. Um, I don't know what the gallows would have been, but this. But I, when I was reading, it said, uh, I'll read to you what. Hanged on gallows, the Persian excursion consisted of being impaled. And if you look at Ezra 6.11, it's likely that they were inventors of Christian. Let's just look back at Ezra.
one of the commentaries I got here said, a pointed stake is set up right in the ground and the culprit is taken uh, and placed on the sharp point and then pulled down by the leg. <sighs> that was Ab Clark. Would that be up? Would that be actually? How he was impaled from the bottom up, or no? Like they put him on. They probably put him like it was close to his heart or something, and then pulled down on his leg so that the, the he would be impaled in the critical parts. Okay, Ezra six eleven um, says that, and I issued a decree that any man who violates this edict. A timber shall be drawn from his house, and he shall be impaled on it, and his house shall be made a refuge heap on the account of this. And it was typical punishment for a serious infraction. You know? Well, that's all I have for today. Anybody? What did we learn from this? Remember, God has his hand in everything. Amen. <laughs> and he, he looks more on her heart than me. Was it important for her to be beautiful on the outside or both? So she had to have the character along with the beauty. Our Lord, all he wants is the beauty in it. Right? It's our heart inside. It's what we, how we dress ourselves on the inside that counts, not the out. Anybody want to close us in prayer? Richard, want to close us in prayer? And don't forget our, I mean, if you feel like God wants you to pick up this ministry right into the shine of man. We still have them Wednesday night for our service, so everybody can be there. 13th chapter of Matthew this, this week. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for each and every word that we've heard. We thank you, Father, for keeping mm -hmm. us and allowing us to see you another day. We ask, Father, for all the problems and everything else that goes on in this world. Lord, have your hand in it, Lord. Yes. And we do realize the biggest problem we got in this nation right now is the dope that's coming into it. Yeah. Reading our young people yeah. away from you. Reading our young people away from church. Father, we pray somehow yes. that we can come to a decision to make them and to have them come back to the house of God and worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. 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 The Word of God works when you work it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> 6.30. <laughs>